the Fallen Wall Science Breakthrough of the Year 2023 in Life Sciences. Breaking the wall to a new green revolution. How RNA modification helps build the crops of the future. Chuan He, the University of Chicago. On November 9th, 1989, I was a college student on campus of the University of Science and Technology of China in Hefei, China. Thank you. I really want to thank the jury for this uh, great honor. Um, some of you perhaps not aware of uh, agriculture in the history. Um, the first one occurred about 12,000 years ago, and I converted the Asian human from hunting to gathering, agriculture began. Second one occurred about the same time of industry revolution, and it's actually led to a variety of different farming techniques uh, that eventually um, 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 agriculture become a business. The most recent one was the green uh, revolution, which was led by scientists uh, such as Dr. Norman Bollock. And this led to a variety of different crops with high yielding and supported the global growth of population. Now we're facing the pressure of global population rise again with the complexity of climate change. And we might need another green revolution. In this summit, they've heard about climate change again and again. Uh, global temperature has been rising in the last several decades, led to different consequences. One of the consequences is actually the redistribution of precipitation. Places I was born, China, were actually gained precipitation, but most of the rest of the world, Europe, America, Africa will actually see reduced precipitation. The higher temperature, the less precipitation will dramatically shape our agricultural practice in decades or even centuries to come. So I was trained as a chemist, I'm a biological chemist, and you wonder why is a biological chemist talking about agriculture? That was not the initial motivation. I was actually fascinated by the complexity of human and which actually unexpectedly led us to plant biology. Now, you and I each have about tens of trillions of cells in our body, 200 different cell types. We can talk, we can walk. If you make a cut, we heal. We're very complicated. Yet, remember, we all come from one single cell, a fertilized egg. That cell differentiates eventually into tens of trillions of cells. What that means is most of our cells share the exact identical sequence of that original cell. This genomic sequence encodes all the information of the life, and it's only three billion base pairs long, three billion, bears, uh, uh, three billion uh, building blocks. Encodes 20,000 genes, only 1.5% of our genome encodes functional proteins. So here's the question. How could 3 billion building blocks with only 1.5% encoding proteins account for the complexity of tens of trillions of cells? Answer is epigenetics, it's chemistry. These DNAs can be modified. The cytosines can be methylated with a lightly methylated sites, the genes are activated with a highly methylated sites, the gene recruit proteins to suppress that gene. It's the same analogy to keys you've seen again and again. It's not a static key. The genome is not a simple static thread of building blocks that has these patterns of T's. And this change in front of every gene is changing in response to signaling, stimulation, environmental cues. Each of this pattern allows you to turn on and off a gene. So it's not just the three billions of flat building blocks that has all the patterns. The complexity of that patterns is enormous. That accounts for tens of trillions of individual cell complexity. So now we know 
In central dogma, the genetic information flows from DNA to RNA to protein, and it's this DNA methylations, it's the modifications on the proteins that wrap DNA around, become nucleosome chromatins. This dictates gene expression and represents the cellular complexity. So about 13 years ago, we proposed this may also occur to RNA, and we actually identify a reversible process. So on messenger RNA, you can also add this methylation or take it out, so you can actually form the similar pattern that allow you to regulate RNA transformation to proteins. This methylation was actually known in 1970s. Previously, by other researchers, they discovered that this is the most abundant modifications internally to mammalian messenger RNA. Every molecule of messenger RNA contains, in average, three methylation. Essential to humans, very important to plant development, conserved in most eukaryotes. However, because of a lack of molecular biology back then, because of a lack of modern mass spec sequencing tools, we, we were not sure about the functional roles of this methylation. We came in in 2011, 2013, discovered two demethylases that can reverse this process. Each of these proteins incredibly important to mammalian early development, suggesting broad regulatory roles of this process uh, to shape the gene expression. And we and others identified and characterized the writer complex that installed the methylation, it's a thousand KD big complex. The fact many components involved suggests this is important to specificity, to really figure out the shape of the, t, uh, of the key. We and others in the field eventually identified, characterized the proteins that recognize these modifications. Some of these proteins are evolved to specifically recognize the methylated RNA. These regulate the decay the translation and the cellular localization of this messenger RNA. Through this process, we uncovered lots of interesting biology, which actually had biomedicine implications. For instance, we played with this protein characterized in my lab. As you can see, this is your hematopoietic stem cell. If we knock it down, we can expand the 14 folds, and this allows us to have stem cells available for bone marrow transplant applications in cell therapies. Another one of this FTO we discovered in my lab is actually highly elevated in leukemia and other cancers. They serve as targets for anti-cancer therapies. I told you epigenetic processes typically respond to environments, to um, stimulation signaling. They're very important in control our immune system. If we modulate these processes, we can actually dramatically enhance immunotherapy in the mouse model, the tumor is almost gone when we combine this with current immunotherapy. And of course, defect of these pathways leads to human diseases such as neuron degeneration. So we had a lot of fun in the last 10 years. We really showed this uh, patterns important to MRA translation. But about five years ago, we asked ourselves again, does this also impact transcription from DNA to RNA, this critical step? Why? Because when we were working on the mRNA methylation, so these are mRNA coming out of DNA, these are the methylations installed by the methyltransferase, we realized the methylation also occurs to other RNAs on the chromatin. These are non-coding RNAs. They don't encode the protein. Some of those are actually ancient viruses invaded into our genome tens of millions of years ago, co-evolved with us, it's called ritual transposon RNAs. They're very important for our development, and these RNAs, although they're non-coding, they regulate chromatin and the transcription. For whatever reason, they're heavily methylated as well. So former postdocs decided to test this, uh, they deleted the methyltransferase, depleted the methylation on these non-coding RNAs. So you can see the nascent RNA production from the genome upregulated dramatically. And this is the technology to visualize the openness of the chromatin. As you can see, the intense grain fluorescence indicates if we get rid of these methyl groups, the entire chromatin opens up. So this methylation not only regulates translation from mRNA to protein, 
but it's very important for transcription and regulation of the chromatin state. So this was actually the first paper uh, we published in 2020 to show this discovery, and we had a lot of fun, but then we asked the next question, is this reversible? As I told you, this pattern needs to be reshaped in response to stimulation, environmental stress, and signaling. We went back to the first demethylase, we discovered this FTO protein. It's a very interesting protein. If you knock it out of the mice, mice died at late embryo stage. Those who were born won't be able to survive past the first or second mice. If you overexpress it in mice, the mice gain 10% of body weight. This one is essential. There's no human being working on Earth with a complete mutation of this one. They are, unfortunately, babies born with partial loss of function mutation, and these have severe cardiovascular neuronal defects. They unfortunately won't survive past the year one or two. We never really know why and how this protein works. We investigated and we realized, that to our surprise, the protein works on this ancient viral RNA invaded into our genome, integrated into our genome tens of millions of years ago. These RNAs are there to regulate early development. The methylation, the demethylation, shape the RNA and regulates local chromatin state, which play key roles during early development. We played with this. We can grow mice a little bigger, a little smaller. We can change their metabolisms, even their IQ. We had so much fun. My former postdoc, Professor Gui Fang Jia, had a different idea. She asked, could we try this in plants? So we inserted this into plants and in rice, in greenhouse, under sufficient light and nutrient conditions, we saw threefold increase of biomass and threefold increase of total grain yield. In real field with limited sunlight, limited nutrient, we still see about 50% increase of yield. So I eat rice, not sure many of you. Here's your potato. <laughs> you also see a 50% increase. We tested in different plants. Most actually work. Some of those do not work. It does not work in every plant, but most of them work. However, one characteristic that seems to conserve in all plant species we tested so far, the engineered plant has longer roots. You can see probably two-fold, sometimes three-fold expansion of the root system. This probably sends the signal up to tell the top to grow. And importantly, this provides plants with robustness against the different stress. Here's one example. On the drought conditions, as you can see, the Y type, the control plants, they're pretty sick. They're yellow. They don't really look well. But look at our plants. They're fine. These plants are also more resistant to alkaline and salt conditions. They have more photosynthesis activity, and they fix more carbon dioxide. In fact, the plant biologist, I was not trained as a plant biologist. The plant biologist told me, with longer roots, this is actually the best way to fix carbon, because that root will transfer carbon to microbes. Eventually, the carbon can be fixed in the soil. Mechanistically, we've been trying to understand what's going on. One thing that really stands out is the stem cells. Just like in the mammalian systems, we work on these proteins. In plants, what it does is it dramatically expand the stem cells as the tip. This is called Mary stem cells as the tip of the root. You can see a lot more proliferation at the tip of the root, which actually drive the expansion of the root system. There's also a lot more stem cells or more active stem cells at the top of the shoot, which drives splitting, uh, tiller generation, and more branch. So I was joked that I was trained as a chemist, uh, become interested in biology, in cancer biology, you know, all kinds of biological chemistry, and now I'm a farmer in Chicago. <laughs> so we now have this Prisker Plant Biology Center. We grow a variety of plants, crops, and we've been working with different uh, partners. We're trying to do two things. Number one, understand what's really going on. What drives the 
stem cells growth and why <coughs> this is important uh, to signal the plants to grow. We'll also try to translate this into real world applications. This is uh, some of the plants you can see we planted the same day. You can visibly see the difference. I hope this could be approach eventually help us solve the food security problems. But I'm also hopeful this will be a way uh, to um, sort of address climate change challenges, not only on crops, but also for grass and trees. Perhaps these plants are more resilient. Uh, they'll be better uh, to grow in the areas with drought. Thank you very much. <laughs>